blackness in visual and solid sonic culture, bringing awareness to sexual violence against and death of black people globally. I'm going to let Dr. Horsley um, translate all of that academic speak for you, but her work is, is brilliant, 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 and does a, lot of, um, does a lot to disrupt how we see and understand um, particularly black female body. And so I'm, I'm excited to have her here. I've known her for many, many years. She's my very, very good friend. And she puts up with a lot of my idiosyncrasies. So thank you for being here, Dr. Dr. Horsley. Um, Clifton Harcum, Clifton, yay. Clifton, before I read Clifton's bio, Clifton is a core member of the Adirondack Diversity Initiative. And I'll give you a little background, a tiny background about the Diversity Initiative. But Clifton um, volunteered to be a part of the core team and, and he's, 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 he's bringing integral knowledge um, excitement and, uh, and a lens that is, is, is actually even more critical right now. So Clifton Harcum is a native of Balt, um, Baltimore, Maryland. He moved here in November. So I moved in, De in December, Clifton came in November. Um, Mr. Harcum has over 10 years experience as a higher education professional. In 2013, he was bestowed the prestigious National re nationally recognized Jefferson Award for Outstanding Service and Volunteerism to the Delmarva region. He also founded the Black Male Initiative, Men Achieving Dreams Through Education, MADE, at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. In 2019, he moved to the Adirondack region and currently serves, right, 2019 November, serves as a diversity officer under the Division of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion at SUNY Potsdam. Thank you, Clifton, for being here with us. Yes, all right, thank you so much. Now, before we move on, I just wanna touch real quickly on um, uh, give you, give you a, a, a briefing of what to expect after this session. So we're gonna have four listen-ins. And as I explained at the beginning, what a listen-in is, um, you can find more information. We'll put everything that I'm saying on our website, diversityadk.org. Um, and um, we'll have four listen-ins that will follow this series. We'll build on what we're speaking about in this session. Then we'll have four teaching teachings where we're asking white allies, white experts, white activists, um, non-black um, people of color to come and, 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 and work with the community on different areas around anti-racism, anti-racism mobilization and how to be an anti-racist ally. Okay, so let's begin. All right. All right, so today's session is called Anti-Racism 101, Checklist for White Allies and Activists. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna, we're gonna give you some, we're gonna talk about foundation knowledges. We need foundational knowledges. We need to understand what we're talking about when we talk about racism, privilege, white privilege, um, implicit bias, what is an ally, right? So these words are being thrown around and, and, and before you can really um, understand how to develop as an anti-racist, you need to know what you're talking about. You need to know foundational knowledge so you can do the, the self-reflective, very difficult self-reflective work um, as a white person that needs to happen. And so our experts here are going to um, tackle um, the different definitions. I'm gonna present a, a, a sort of a dictionary uh, or a, a generally agreed upon definition of the of the term. And then our experts are gonna um, discuss and, and talk amongst ourselves um, what this means, how this manifests in society. So let's begin. Racism, okay. Racism, so um, an interesting thing happened, right? So as we were preparing for this, Dr. Horsley said to me, do you know that Miriam Webster just updated their definition of, 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 of racism because uh, a black radical fem activist feminist um, scholar um, and, and, and um, recent graduate of law school said that this does not look like what we, like our lived experiences today. So they agreed and recently, just this month, agreed to update their um, definition of racism. So I'm gonna read that and then turn it over to the panel to, to sort of deconstruct what racism is and looks like today. So according to Miriam, Miriam Webster, the updated um, uh, definition for racism. So it was a belief that race is the primary determinant, this was the original definition, determinant of human traits and capacities, and that racial differences produce an inherent superiority of, of a particular race. 
they updated it to include a doctrine or political program based on the assumption of racism and designed to execute its principles, a political or social system founded on racism, racial prejudice, or discrimination. So I'm going to turn it over to our panelists. Let's start with Michelle. So there we go. What is racism? I think I'm partial to both definitions um, in, in talking about some of the prejudice, but I think one of the things that it doesn't talk about is that power piece, you know, and um, there is the, I think he was the founder of Crossroads, Joseph Barton, and he talks about racism as having these three degrees of power. And that is the power for people of whiteness to benefit themselves, right? And to protect themselves. But it's also the second degree of power is to destroy people of color. And then the third one, which I think is really important, especially for people that are on this call and that will see themselves as allies is the power to destroy everybody, including the anti-racists or the allies that are trying to disrupt the system, the system that we talk about. Mm -hmm. So when we, when we talk about racism, I always want to bring us back to those three degrees of power because sometimes we, we tend to forget that the power that is used to maintain racism can also be used to destroy people that are trying to disrupt the system. Exactly. I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm Marsha Nicole, Dr. Horsley. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I can't control whether my camera is on and off. The host is doing that. Um, but um, oh, okay. yes, I, I, I so love, um, here we go. Okay. There we go. Sorry. There you go. <laughs> I, I so love that definition and including that power piece because I think that's very necessary. Um, I like to think about race and racism through white privilege sometimes. And when I'm talking to my students um, who are predominantly white, um, we talk about racism and how they're taught not to see it. And it becomes this invisible kind of conference for them. And they just kind of walk into this understanding of um, I, I benefit, but I, I don't understand I benefit. It's just, you know, it, it happens because this is how the world is shaped. And if you don't benefit, it's due because of, you know, you just didn't work hard enough and I worked at it. Um, and so I think that's really important to really think about the power piece um, for, for everyone, but it, particularly for um, white individuals. Exactly. Clifton, what do you think? I, I agree completely. And I think it's going to lead into uh, another, another word that we're going to look at earlier as far as uh, white supremacy and white privilege and the impact on how people see race and understand racism. So I'm just mm -hmm. waiting until we get to our, our other topics. Yeah. I guess I, I, I'm glad that you, um, that the, the, the definition was updated and that Michelle talked specifically, Michelle and um, 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 Marsha Nicole um, talked about power because I was at a women's empowerment um, conference and a white woman stood up and she, she was asking, she was saying, you know, I really do want to see, what can we do? I really do want to see more women in, in positions of power, but I'm not sure if I can, I like the way power is used and deployed, especially when it comes in a, a capitalist system, especially when it comes to deal with, deal with um, dealing with employees. And I said to her, I, I, the, 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 you shouldn't be afraid of the power. Because if you, you, what you need to do is get yourself some power and use it because as the holder or the possessor of that power, if you have, if you are coming from an anti, anti-racist framework, you already understand that you're articulating power differently and you can use it to benefit, right, towards equity and inclusion. So, so that's the, um, and to, towards disrupting um, systemic racism and, 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 and transformational justice. So um, it's not, it, we should not be afraid of power. We should always be um, reticent of how we're using that power and, and, and what, what is informing our, our use of the power and deployment of the power. So yeah, so I really appreciate that. Now, the next word I wanna take on is prejudice, prejudice. So let me give you the definition. And this is from Merriam-Webster again. So we're going to leave the, the PowerPoint alone. 
because everybody knows when we say prejudice, right? And I don't want to move because this is our, our little round table, even though we're far away. Um, Miriam Webster says prejudice is injury or damage resulting from some judgment or action, right? But it also says it is um, it is a preconceived judgment or opinion, an adverse opinion or leaning formed without just grounds or before sufficient knowledge. An irrational attitude of hostility directed against an individual, a group, a race, or their supposed characteristics. What do you think? Break it down for me, folks. Talk mm -hmm. to me. What prejudice looks like in real life, especially when it comes to Black folks? Yeah, I, for me, I, you know, when I, I hear this, I think about using a thimble full of information to inform an ocean full of knowledge. So if you have information about one person or, or you have this prejudgment, and usually it is without merit, it's without any, any real form of, of true data and it's a judgment. Mm -hmm. But then you take that and you sort of like run with it and you paint a brush and a tapestry for everything and everybody that looks like that. You know, so for me, as, as, a, as a black woman, um, and as you can hear from my accent, I come from a land afar. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are associations people make of me based on the assumptions that they have about what black woman is. You know, that black woman may be supposed to be denurturing and like the mammy, or when I don't fall into that category that, oh, so you're the black bad girl. You know, and all of those are based on, on prejudices, not stopping to think, well, um, you're the yogi and you're the Buddhist and that just is who you are, but not based on some prejudgment I have of, of who you're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Yes, or the angry black woman, right? Mm. So often, um, I've, been, I've been called angry because um, I'm speaking truth to power. I walk in and I'm not the, the, um, the smiling caretaker mammy, right? Right. So, yeah, or I don't have a ready smile on my face. Or I'm so when you're not so angry yet. enough, that confuses them because wait, 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 you just switched yeah. the script. Yeah, yeah. What's going on there? You know, you're and, not and, sort of like that prejudgment of who I thought you'd be. Mm -hmm. And for, for, most, for most Black people, we understand that as racial codes, right? That it's come out of a prejudice. So, um, Marsha Nicole, Dr. Horsley. Hmm. Um, I, I love that uh, we we switched the language right and talked about prejudgment, mm -hmm. um, you know, because people walk into this kind of um, understanding or misunderstanding. They confuse racism for prejudice, <laughs> you know, and you can be prejudiced against someone who um, is of a particular size or abled or disabled body. Um, you could think about prejudice in terms of even homophobia in some senses. Um, so it's very different, right? Um, racism is predicated on race and yeah. color. Um, and so these actual systems um, that think about advantages based on skin color. Um, so I think prejudice is really important to think about because some people will confuse and say, you know, well, non-white people can be racist too. And then the question is, well, can non-white people be prejudiced or can they not be racist, right? Well, yeah. non-white people cannot be racist, right? Yeah. Because that power structure is there and we have no systematic power, um, but we can be prejudiced, right? Um, and so I know Clifton, I think, had said something about this earlier as well. So I'm going to get back to that because because I think people need to know about this the power and racism. You just said that, um, and and so you just said that we people of color can't be racist because of because the power structure is there. So we okay. don't have any systemic race um, power. Right. So I want to get back to that because we need to to um, unpack that a little bit. Um, Clifton. Yeah, and I just want to speak briefly from a, a black male's perspective where, you know, the, the, the national, uh, the media is really covering prejudices towards black males in particular. Mm -hmm. And if you really look back at history, we're looking at the whole, the racial slur that was used for black men called being a black buck. And it was this whole idea that black men are overly sexual, they're predators, they're going to attack white women, they're threatening. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. When we're looking at prejudice, we're kind of looking at it in real time and not just now, but it's been happening since, you know, we were brought here as, as Africans. Um, you know, when we're looking at that, 
that's one of the major issues that we're having going on right now. And that seems to have um, survived mm -hmm. all these years in particular towards black men where we see the, the George Floyds and we see many other African-American males um, being looked at in that way. Um, it's part of the whole white supremacy privilege. It's part of the whole cycle of really just labeling people um, as beneath you and we're superior. And it's unfortunate that is a black male, um, and normally a black buck, they were tall, muscular, kind of like my size. I'm 6'4", mm -hmm. like 280. You know, you're looked at as a threat. You're being prejudged before you even spoken to. So we see what just happened in Atlanta. Is there so many, many current events that mm -hmm. far surpass slavery that we're still dealing with this yeah. day when it comes to the term of uh, um, uh, prejudice? Yeah. All right, um, Dr. Horsley. Could you go back to the the idea of of um, um, people of color not not being able to don't can't participate in racism because of the no systemic power there? Mm -hmm. um, and I also want to think about what Clifton just said as well, right? Because we have the black buck who then turns into the black male rapist. Mm -hmm. um, there's still this constant fear, still this kind of you know psychological terror that um, you know Trayvon Martin gets hunted down um, in the middle of the street um, at night, and he's seen as a terror. And then we have um, you know Ahmad Aubrey as well, who's running through his neighborhood, and um, two people feel they have the right to then tackle him and kill him. Mm -hmm. um, so thinking about these acts of power and how people can just assume that, you know, we don't belong in spaces that clearly we belong in. Um, I can guess, I can say, for example, where I'm at, the college that I'm at, um, we now have a person of color. We have two people um, that are um, the president and the provost, and they're both women of color, um, Black women. And um, although they are in these positions, it's ultimately that they have no <laughs> systemic power in this play, right? They still have to be holding to stakeholders, whether the bar, the trustees, um, the faculty is predominantly white institution. Um, and so they might be there, right? But still they have ultimately no power. And I also think about myself um, as um, a professor, right? And usually I'm the most degree person in my classroom. However, I sit there in fear because ultimately um, being at a PWI, it's and when I say PWI, predominantly white institution, mm -hmm. um, the students have a lot of control and they usually don't want to talk about race or deal with it because they have never had to before. Mm -hmm. um, and especially with um, a person, a black person. And I know later we're going to start to talk about the difference between um, black people and saying POC, right, or Arlana, mm -hmm. that I'm learning that is more prevalent in this particular community or area yeah. because there are differences between us, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. so I want to I, I want to keep us moving, but I do want to um, um, it sort of mirror what Dr. Horsley is saying um, that I never say people of color and, and just lump black people into it. Black people and POCs, people of color, is not interchangeably because our lived experiences and our relationship to race and racism is very, very different. Okay, so that that is that is something that is important, um, and I want to emphasize. The next term I want to to, to quickly go to is white supremacy because the, the the important thing here is to going through these terms. They, these terms are being used frequently now. Okay, and people who want to be allies and activists need to understand what they mean and how they are, um, how they implicate their lived experiences, how they are participating in um, these systems. So white supremacy. Now, Wikipedia, and I usually tell my students not to use Wikipedia, but <laughs> this is the shortest version of it all, right? So don't use Wikipedia unless you're gonna do some research to back it up. So um, the belief that white people are superior to those of all other races, especially the black race, and should therefore dominate society. That's what Wikipedia says. I know, I'm like, I can't say anything more than that. They hit it on the head. All right, let's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna let Marsha, um, Dr. Horsley um, start. I know, right? Damn, <laughs> yes, go ahead, girl. I mean, um, usually when I talk about mm -hmm. um, white supremacy, white privilege, yes. I usually use Peggy Megintosh's article she wrote in 1989. And attacking the invisible knapsack of white privilege, right? Mm -hmm. And she's yeah. a white woman and she talks about um, how she even comes to even think about this. She's thinking about white men who have the most privilege, right? Yes. 
usually white men who are yeah. landowners, who are heterosexual, have the most privilege. And so as a white woman, she's coming to these understandings about power and then how to think about them in this intersectional interlocking. And when I say intersectional or interlocking, I mean like race, class, gender, sexuality, ability, disability, all those things, right? Um, and so she talks about that and she, you know, she says um, she was taught that racism is only like this individual act of meanness right. and not this right. in, uh, invisible system uh -huh. that confers dominance on her group, right? And so she started to realize these hierarchies and these disadvantages and aspect of white privilege, um, which put her at an advantage. Um, and so she then even starts to question, right, that word privilege, because in it, she said it's misleading. Um, and usually when people think of privilege as being a favored state, whether it's earned or confirmed mm -hmm. by birth or luck, yet some of the conditions that she talked about are described in her document where she goes and she talks about her everyday privileges of being white. She can sleep in her house without fear of someone yes. breaking in and yes. murdering her. Yes. She can walk down the street and go buy a pack of cigarettes without yes. thinking that someone's yes. going to accuse her of a crime, yes. right? And so she talks about that and how um, this has been systematic, right? It's working mm -hmm. to overpower a certain group and then disadvantage the other. Yes. Um, and so, um, yeah, I'll let someone else take up from there. <laughs> yeah, and I just wanted to chime in yeah. real quick uh, before Michelle spoke. And when you're thinking about uh, white supremacy, we're looking at something even bigger than that. It's a term that I don't think a lot of people speak about anymore is manifest destiny, which gives white supremacists the whole idea that God has put them in place to run everything, which leads, which trickles down to you have your white supremacy, then you have your white privilege. So if you're looking at white supremacy as a topic, you need to look at the, the greater cause, which is if you really believe that God put you on earth to rule over everyone, then you feel like you have more power to influence uh, society as a whole. And that's a global idea. Like mm -hmm. our yes. destiny is to take over the yeah. world. So yeah, I'm, but I'm that sorry. was part that was part of the so in my in my in my courses I teach about um I, I usually ask what came first, slavery or, or uh, slavery or race, and mm -hmm. then racism, right? So if you understand what came for, came first and the knowledges that were produced to maintain and perpetuate a system right then you will understand um that the what 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 um clifton is talking about when he talks about that so um we can talk about the courses that we offer at adi later on yay but, <laughs> but you're also hitting on capitalism yes. right oh um, yes <laughs> I mean, that we're really probably skating around all of us, right? Oh, yeah. And, uh, yes. What was the enslaved African to the economy at the time, right? And yes. How did, yes. How did it then, how did that, yes. you know, that marking of that wounded mm -hmm. and then also the use of religion, right? Um, if you yes. watch Harriet, the movie, yes. Yes. right? Like it was like yeah. this was your destiny, this was your faith, and this is who you are. It's yeah. God. It's not us, it's God. Yes, yes, yes. So I'm just this, and I, I can see Michelle just teaming and ready to go oh um, um i do i've been doing two um cultural consciousness what you would call diversity training but i don't we don't we don't do diversity training in this room we do cultural consciousness critical consciousness development and so in my last um i wanted people i was we were at wide privilege and so i wanted to um my the the participants to think about privilege in a way that wasn't wrapped up in meritocracy right something earned and i said to them we're going to think about how um uh, how about, I want you to tell me when was the first time you thought about race? When did you know that there was a race, there were races? And what was the race? And what was the context of how you, you, you were introduced to the race? When did you think about, okay, so most of it was black and negative. When did you, when did you know, if you were white, if it's white, when did you know that you were white? Did somebody explain this to you? And throughout, and in every instance, most of them couldn't find a moment where they realized that they were white. And that's a privilege. That's a privilege. So we had um, a session the other day where I was, I was, I was connecting with um, the black community in the Adirondacks and North Country. And um, we talked about the, the precarity that the outdoors, this is a beautiful, I love this place. I love everything about it, it's gorgeous. But it, it, for, for people who, for we who are black, it is not safe. We don't see the outdoors in the same way. We don't have the same relationship to the outdoors because we are not allowed to. We are not allowed to. And every, all of these videos that are filtering in today, all of them, most of them happen, except for Breonna Taylor, most of them happen on the out, in the outdoors. 
So what does that say about how we see the Adirondacks? What does that say about making the Adirondacks more inclusive and welcoming? And whether or not we want to risk our lives, even coming from New York City all the way up here and being stopped 15 million times by the police. Anyway, Michelle, Dr. Crown, <laughs> Dr. Cromwell. I'm starting to so, breach. There, there's this, I mean, there's so much I can say, but one of the things I think, especially when we're talking to, to white audiences as you know, black, indigenous, and people of color. I think when we talk about white supremacy, it's important for us to distinguish white supremacy from people that wear a pointy hat with holes for their eyes, not necessarily the same. So we're talking about two different things and we're really talking about this system of power that then is almost like a social currency. It's a system of power, that supremacy or that dominance. And you know, Clifton talked about that manifest destiny or the racial contract. So let's, hold on. Can you explain, because I think we're using that and not maybe not everybody in the audience understands what is manifest destiny? So it's almost like God's 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 rule. It's like a contract, that moral contract that this is what is going to happen. Mm -hmm. But coming back to that idea of white supremacy, we have to understand that the supremacy or the dominance you have is what enables you to buy or to earn that privilege. Right, it's that that power, the supremacy, is what gives you the privilege. So sometimes it's very easy to talk about white privilege, but that's like the chicken and the egg. What came before that? It's the supremacy, yeah. and I feel that's hard for people to to like buy into. And this, I think, it was last week with my black mouth. I dared to talk about whiteness, and people came after me like drones because that white supremacy and whiteness are sort of like wrapped up in each other. Mm -hmm. And it's sometimes hard to, hard, to, hard to understand this thing that you embody. Because one of the things I like to say is a fish does not know it's swimming in water, mm -mm. right? So if you don't know, that's that blissful ignorance or the structural blindness. If you don't know about your supremacy and you don't know or understand your whiteness, then you can't disrupt it then you can't dismantle it. And I think for many people of whiteness, you have been good students. Mm -hmm. You have been taught not to think about your whiteness or the supremacy that you have. And therefore you don't have to dismantle it and you don't have to dis disrupt it. And I think a part of our conversation this evening is really not calling you out, but it's calling you in to say, this is, this is, this is a reality. Yeah. This is, this just is. And to sit with that and then figure out what do you need to do next? I like that. Not calling you out, calling you in. No, it's, it's calling yeah. people in. Yes. Because we all suffer from white supremacy, right? Mm -hmm. And I like to also change the language to that and call it white dominance. That's yeah. it. Because <laughs> um, one, there's nothing supremacist about it. Um, but the dominance, I think, allows us to really understand and take it in what is it doing, right? It's dominating. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Now we, the next one was was white privilege, but I think we 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 went back and forth and touched on what that is, so we can move on now quickly. Implicit bias. Now implicit bias. Here we go, Clifton. Implicit bias. Thoughts and feelings are implicit if we are unaware of them or mistaken or mis or mistaken mistake mistaken about their nature. We have a bias when rather than being neutral, we have a preference for or aversion to a person or group of people. Thus, we use the term implicit bias to describe when we have attitudes towards people or associate stereotypes with them without our conscious knowledge. So I thought that was a really good sort of um, accessible um, definition of implicit bias for us to start with. So let's go ahead, Michelle, why don't you start? Well, I mean, there isn't much to say about implicit bias other than that I feel that, that we all have this, that we, we can all be implicitly biased. Yes. Both, you know, black folks, indigenous folks, people of color, but also people of whiteness. Yes. It's kind of like it's the human condition, right? Mm -hmm. That we have these schemata in our heads that, that determine how we see certain things based on some prejudgment. Yeah. And sometimes it's not here, it's down in our unconscious or the subconscious and we act on it. 
Yeah. And, and that's, it's a part of, you know, I like to, when I'm doing like dialogues, I say, hi, I'm Michelle. And I have implicit bias. I'm biased. I am. Instead of making people feel that this is some bad thing that just certain people have. Mm-hmm. But we all have these based on the way our brain operates. But I think the thing is, once we become aware mm-hmm. and it's no longer implicit, Mm-hmm. and you're aware of it it's what you now do with that information because when you when you say wait did I just think that or did I just do that then you can check yourself you know there's that song check yourself before you wreck yourself mm-hmm. so I feel that once you're aware of that bias then it's it's hair so you always have to have it there and that's something that I have to do once yeah, I'm yeah. aware of some bias I have I'm like oh did I just think that did I just do that but now I'm aware so it's mm-hmm. now outside and it's here. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, I want to just piggyback off what Michelle said. And I think that's the most important part, being aware that you do have a bias. And it's saying it's okay. Like, it's not okay, but it is okay. Um, and it's mainly due to what society is portraying, uh, portraying to you about the people that you're interacting with. But I think to be an ally, to walk around and say, well, no, I never had this type of view or I don't believe this. And it's just unrealistic based off of how society, when we go back to the top, when we talk about mm-hmm. supremacy, how these images have been put in your head through movies, radio, music, people you may know. So recognizing that, listen, it, it may be a bias there that I'm not aware of, that I am portraying through my actions. Um, just that acknowledgement is a start when it comes to allyship and, and, and being an uh, accomplice. Right, Michelle. <laughs> We're gonna get to that. I found a, a wonderful website that that gives me the information on that. But yeah, Dr. Horsley, there's a deep investment in whiteness, right? I mean, that's undeniable. And you know, too Alan. many too many black people mean it's gonna be ghetto or it's gonna be hood, right? Or it's gonna be less than. And we don't want to admit that. I go back and think about um Dr. Kenneth um Clark, and he did the the blue eye doll test. Remember. Mm-hmm. And the little black kids, they preferred the white dolls with blue eyes and they didn't know why, right? Yeah. But somewhere, somehow they had been taught that that's better, that that's good. And the black dolls, they all said it, were um, criminal, they were evil, they were dirty. They were ugly. They were yeah. ugly, right? Like all these different things. Yeah. And so that even, you know, when I think about white privilege and white dominance um, and why it's so hard for white people to talk about race, right? Mm-hmm. And that's a book, White Fragility. Um, and it kind of triggers come about when people get defensive and, actions and feelings and behaviors such as anger, fear, mm-hmm. silence come about because, you know, you're just not accustomed to thinking and talking about racism. And I think about it as a, stretch, uh, a spectrum, right? You, we always see like, you know, Michelle was saying the, the, the hats of the clan, the clan mm. that's the most extreme. That's the picture of racism. And that's only, it's not, you know, these everyday acts of violence and racism that we think about that's in between this and that, right? I mean, I think that that's where we need to start to think about um, dismantling this invest, investment in whiteness. And when we think about PWIs, and that's like my thing right now, because- um, Definitely a, white institutions. Right, so, it's an investment yeah. in keeping it white for a reason. We're not thinking about decolonizing the university as we should, mm-hmm. that would be bad for business. This is a business. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I and, guess and, I- and I worked at it, and I'm sorry, real quick, because we're talking about universities, it's important that when, we, when we're talking about this, um, sort of with uh, Nicole said earlier, is that I worked at an HBCU for over a decade, like 13 years. And the majority of people, some people look at, some people look at attending an HBCU as less than. Uh, attending a PWI and that you get a better education at a PWI than you do HBC, even though that's not the case at all. But that perception yeah. is sort of what you're, what you're talking about as far as how institutions are. They don't want to be a, uh, uh, have, you know, want to be HBCU because now you're, you're looked at as less than and not as high quality of an education. So I when we're looking that. at this topic, it's, it's so much about society that is in, in, intertwined. And we all saw it by the same system, right? So, you know, and I say that, I like to say that we're good students. So if we, if we agree that racism is systemic and that a mm. part of the system is making sure that it, up, that it upholds the system. Mm. So even though we have said that, that black folks and other people of color can't be racist, they can have those prejudices which lead to implicit bias. And because mm. we're taught by a system 
that mm -hmm. maintains and perpetuates and teaches white dominance. People of color and black folks and indigenous folks, they taught that dominance of whiteness. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so sometimes I would say that in some occasions, some of the people that have treated me the worst in institutions are some of my own people. Mm -hmm. And that's because they have been really good yes. students, yes. you know, in that they, they, they pathologize you, mm -hmm. right? They marginalize you yeah. and they put you under surveillance yes. because yes. they have yes. worn the mantle of the oppressor. They have been good students yes. and have been taught that, yeah, mm -hmm. the system sees you as subdigno, so I'm going to treat you as though you're less than. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So the next one is we're getting to allyship. So anti-racism, and I want to keep us moving along. Anti-racism. So anti-racism and anti-racism. I'm gonna I'm gonna go between the American English and the Jamaican English here. Anti and anti. Anti-racism. Anti-racism is the active process of identifying and eliminate, eliminating racism by changing systems, organizational structures, policies and practices, and attitudes so that power is redistributed and shared equally. I know that most, most Americans don't like to hear about redistribution of anything. <laughs> so yeah. So here we go. Oh, truth to power, because you can't talk about, you cannot talk about systemic racism without talking about capitalism. Ooh, hmm. neoliberal capitalism. So, hey, what do you, anti-racism, here's the definition, let's do this. Because we ain't got a whole lot of time. I want to take some questions. I'm going to be I'm going to be easy and just say that if you're going to be anti, you have to be anti, which means you have to act. You have to do something. It's not good enough to say that I, I'm not or I'm none. I'm non-racist or I'm not a racist. That's not an anti-racist. Mm -hmm. To be anti, you have to be intentionally doing something. So it's not sitting in front of the TV and saying, well, I'm a good person. I don't do this, I donate to that, and I have a, a black brother-in-law and a Native American sister-in-law, and yes. I treat them well, and we have these conversations. Not good enough. You have to do something intentionally. Actually, that's kind of, I find that problematic when I am um, talking about anti-racism, or even when I introduce myself, people, um, white people get nervous and uncomfortable, and they instantly start talking about their one black friend or the, 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 you know, the relative that they have who's biracial or something as though that, you know, that absolves you from doing the work yourself, right. from doing okay. the critical work on yourself. It, it actually is annoying and it shuts, it shuts me down. I know that. Um, so yeah. Um, Dr. Horsley. Well, I mean, yeah, anti-racism and, um, Kendi's book, Abram Kendi's book is doing like fabulous. This is like number one on the charts, right? So everybody's yeah. reading how to be an anti-racist. Right? <laughs> everybody's uh, grabbing that book. Right. And I'm, I'm for that. I think everybody should yes. be anti-racist yeah. and all of that. But I'm most concerned for me and my, my brothers, my sisters, our kids, mm -hmm. our babies about right. anti-Blackness and anti-Black violence, you know? Ooh. So, get there. so let's quickly get there. Yes. Right. You know, that's the that's the biggest thing for me because I think that sits at the hub of everything. Yes. When you think about race, yes. it's always through the racialized body, which is always the black body. Mm -hmm. Everybody either benefits or gets harmed on that idea of blackness. Yes. Um, you know, and so everybody, you know, shoots and tries to get far away, you know, further away from yes. the blackness. But yes. whatever culture, wherever community, mm -hmm. you know, yes. the darker people, the people who are at the mm -hmm. bottom yeah. and have systematically kept at the the bottom yes. the dark skinned people or you know like the black people um yeah. so that to me is the biggest thing for us to think about and then we internalize that ourselves and try to move so far away from it not just mm -hmm. in terms of who we mate with um and who we marry but also you know um how we see ourselves in this kind of idea of assimilation mm -hmm. um and it, it becomes it. very problematic right because we internalize self-hate and white supremacy mm -hmm. or white domination is at the bottom of all of this, right? There's so many discourses that get disrupted us, us thinking about what white domination has done to us all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. That's the destruction. Yes, we are, so exactly, Dr. Horsley brought it to, to where it needs to be, anti-blackness. And, and um, the other day when I was um, speaking at the Saranac Lake protest, I said, we are here because of systemic racism and anti-blackness, right? Mm -hmm. 
And you have to understand that the protests and the mobilization and the willingness of our white brothers and sisters to start looking um, closely and to, to, to take on the discomfort of talking about race and whiteness um, is because of the black bodies that you're seeing dying on the streets. It's because of the fact that um, um, the black people, the black people or black peoples are three times more likely, sometimes four and five more likely to die from COVID, right? And so, and, um, and so, so here we are, we have to grapple with what anti-Blackness means. So here, a definition of anti-Blackness is um, anti-Black racism. So I'm gonna say anti-Black racism is the specific exclusion and prejudice against people visibly mm -hmm. or perceived to be of African descent. What most of us would commonly call Black people, right? This is from um, um, Kim McIntosh. So, so let's let's grapple with that because that's that's very different from from people of color, right? Hmm. Anti-blackness is 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 um is what is what has been used to to create this this wonderful bed of capitalism we live in. Let's talk about that. You know, anti-blackness is why um, seventy five percent of our bodies, our people, represent seventy five percent of the the prison population. You know, anti-blackness anti-blackness so i mean um talk to me what do we do with that how do we how do we work with allies or people who white allies who want to become anti-racist begin working towards the the law the lifelong process of being an anti-racist because anti-blackness you know this is what we live with every day well, I like that Kendi does have a book, um, an, a, a one for children, right, for parents, yes. and how to teach their kids how to be anti-racist. Um, and I think it starts early, early on, because you just automatically, the signs, the cues, the everyday, the optics or the visuals, they teach us that whiteness is the default. It's the thing that you want to do and be. And it's so mm -hmm. invisible. You don't even understand it, but it becomes synonymous with this kind of idea of humanity. And then blackness is stripped mm -hmm. from its humanity, right? It becomes a commodity. Be commodity, it becomes disposable, um, it depreciates Black um, humanity, it's a denial of Black pain, it's the obstruction of Black agency, it's perpetual process of dehumanization, mm -hmm. right, but it's, it's an active thing that keeps, you know, keep Black people at the bottom, and, and it does so much. I, I always think about Black studies and Indigenous studies. Um, black studies was the first, <laughs> the first area of racial studies to be in the institution, um, yet it's still struggling today. Multiculturalism comes comes about, ethnic studies comes about, women and gender studies comes about, all on the backs of Black studies, while we're still struggling yeah. to have whole departments and, and teach people, and, and everybody's climbed up on our backs. Matter of fact, they don't even help us unless they're, they see themselves in it, right? And I mean, we can even get into this idea about how people, you know, are now talking about, well, you don't mention certain genders when it comes to this particular you know, idea of who's being killed. I'm yeah. like, Black people are being killed. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So anti-blackness is so it, there's such an investment that we don't even get it, um, and we have to because oh, even goodness. people of color, right? They benefit from anti-blackness. Mm -hmm. Yes, let's talk about that because I want to ask and, and spread it out. What does anti-black like look like outside of academia? Because you're all in academia, but you're community <laughs> activists as well. So what does that look like in in in, in the community? And I want to talk about what that looks like right here in the Adirondack and North Country. What does anti-blackness look like? It looks like, I'll use James Baldwin's word, it looks like a death of the heart. Mm -hmm. And James Baldwin talks about moral apathy. Mm -hmm. And it's an inability to have a, an emotional connection to people and things that are Black. Because, because you see them as subhuman and you've been taught to pathologize them and to marginalize them so that there is no connection, there's no emotional connection. And you know, I, I always say that if you can't see that person as yourself, and that's the Buddhist mm -hmm. me talking, if you can't see that person suffering and that person's pain as yours, then all bets are off. And mm -hmm. that's the problem with anti-blackness. It's 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 a it's that that moral apathy where there's just no or very little emotional connection or where they can switch it on and off, yeah. but it has to stay on because this is a human being. And and, and, okay. and really, 
when we're looking at anti-blackness, I think about it, just think about it. 16, was it 16, 19, 20 or so Africans were brought to America and it was as slaves, as property were abused. And it wasn't until the fifties that the whole idea, you know, it wasn't really until the fifties that we were actually considered equal. You know, uh, oh, yeah, that, they, that the three fifths of a human was taken. Yeah. Out. yeah. You know, you think about the Jim, Jim Crow laws to say separate but equal. Then you, you know, you have to think about all these court cases that had to happen just, and that wasn't until 1954 that, uh, that that decision was overturned where we were all considered equal. Uh, you know, so what you get back is to is like the empathy. You know, like this whole conversation and everything that's going on when it comes to anti blackness, how to be an ally. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the hardest things and being black, and I think it's the saddest thing, is that people hate you. People despise you. People look down to you just because the color of your skin. Like, if you can really just look at how how ignorant and how hateful and how despicable and disgusting that is, you know, in 2020, after everything we've done through this whole entire time being here, um, that's how you become a... a, a ally in my mind that's how you we can start that process by looking at us like we're human you know looking at us not like our skin is beneath someone else or it's you know it's, it's, it's like a vile structure that has been associated with just our skin color we've accomplished many things in this country that have changed the course of the world and you know just because of this we're still less than we had a black president because he was black, he was a monkey, his wife was a gorilla, they were this and that. Like those are the type of things that, that show that lack of empathy and that lack of, of compassion mm -hmm. from a people that have been brought here as, as products. Yeah. You know, if you really think about that, if you wanna be an ally, if you know people who are racist and hateful towards black people, just think about it. We're here today, we were brought here as a product. Just imagine if you want to be an ally, if you know people who are racist, just imagine a situation where, yeah. you know, your husband and your wife or your boyfriend, whatever your relationship status is, you're broken up, your kids are sold off and you're sitting, you know, like mm -hmm. educate yourselves. We can talk all day, you know, yeah. 2020, and this is my stance when it comes yeah. to this whole ally. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I try not to be too, too, but I have to. It's 2020, we have Google, we have YouTube, we have all kinds of search engines, books, libraries. Mm -hmm. yeah. Educate yourself on the history of Black Americans. Don't run from it. You know, we, we brought up some terms earlier for a reason. Mm -hmm. We brought those terms up so people can like see. Like mm -hmm. this is what this is built on. Now educate yourself, dig even deeper into these different things and educate yourselves. Mm -hmm. And then when you see these, I'm sorry, I'm yeah. going a little too long, but no, when, no, you no. These, no, no. when you see no, these no, injustices, yeah. when mm -hmm. you see these injustices done mm -hmm. and you're educated, because you educated yourself, you realize that it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. You realize that Confederate statues and Confederate flags are a sign of hatred. And even if you're American, you believe that they're not, and people say it's heritage, you know, think about the whole concept is that the Civil War was started over slavery. Mm. <laughs> the, 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 the Confederate, they broke away from the Union. So that's like anti-American, even if you think that, you know, whatever. So, All like, right, Cl Cl Clifton, you're going into some discussions that we're going to save for our next, our next. <laughs> but, but we're talking about but the thank empathy, you. The I so know because we could go I'm on and on. One of the, the one of, yeah. but the empathy is so yeah. important. Yes. When it comes. One to of that. the one of the the a very very easy what I sort of eye opening um, um, activity that I use in one of my sessions is to um, to ask. Um, everyone to look in, go online, find a, a King James Version Bible and type in the word black and see him and see the references that come up to black and see if they are what in what context, right? Um, and do the same for the dictionary and write down every single definition of black in the dictionary. Because this, these, these, these texts are, 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 are foundational in terms of, of who had the power to create knowledge that was then um, distributed as, as, as critical knowledge under um, um, colonialism and capitalism and imperialism, right? So how did, and that is all a process of socialization. If, if every single reference to the term black is pejorative and negative, and then you attach that term to a body, mm -hmm. what do you expect? Just like how Michelle uses people of whiteness, right? You're not black 
but the term black that is pejorative and negative is has been attached to a figure's physical being right and you've been socialized through every single point of your human development to attach black which is negative to a physical body then what you're going to get all white right people benefits right we think about the civil rights moment yeah um, who benefited? White women benefited the most Thank from you. the civil rights yeah. movement, right? Disproportionately. Yeah, white women benefited from, from the, the civil rights movement and people didn't um, disproportionately. Mm -hmm. and, and, and people either didn't know, didn't want to know, or because they were, they were participating at a, at a different level in, in the power, in white power, in the power that's, that's associated with whiteness, they kept them out shut right well yeah. they're a minority women are minorities right and so we don't think about the racialized component of that yes, <laughs> um, yes. that's uh, another conversation yes. all yes. the time, right all uh, right <laughs> so we 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 went, we went over so i'm gonna I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to keep it going. And, and we, you know, like yes. you can't even get a bottle of orange juice. I, I remember the, the 1995 riots, right? Yes. Um, and Latasha Hardings is killed over a dollar fifty orange juice that she intended to pay for by a Korean store owner, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it, it gets caught on tape. And that's the only way that a form of justice was happening, right? Rodney King videotaped. Otherwise, you know, people don't believe it. You yeah. know, what happened to George Floyd was nothing new. The only exactly. thing that, happened is that people got to see it. Yeah. What about the, the hundreds and thousands that are not caught on tape? And so somebody asked me, so why is this moment different? Why is it different, Nikki? And I said, it's, it's, it's a confluence of factors, right? A lot of things are happening now. And I think it started with the 2016 election, right? Mm -hmm. There are people started huddling in their corners, becoming more and more sort of um, um, grounded in their ideological positions. And then um, this, this, this occupying force in the White House is justifying a lot of overt acts of racism, right? People would, yeah, so so people are feeling very bold and proud about their positions now. And there's no room for dialogue. There's no room for discussion. But you know what? I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad because no, I'm, not, I'm not glad about, about, about the murder of my Black people. But I'm I think not, it goes to your next point about decentering the self, right? Exactly. Because if they don't feel it, they don't understand it. You shouldn't have to feel it yeah. to have the ear to understand that you're going to benefit from this. Yes. Because that the 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 current um um uh, the current holder holder of the office has has just ripped the wound off of the, the the bloody the bloody the bloody sore that's called racism, right? And so we have to face it. And then you add that to COVID, who's that just locked us down, and we can't do nothing. And most for for those of us who were who are privileged enough to be able to um, be able to work from home and homeschool and all of these other things, the only interaction we had with the world was the screen right and remember you know, yes you might have been able to buy your alcohol in bulk but you can't de you can't anesthetize yourself you can't um you can't run from the images that are coming at you daily by going to the bar right which we have what six six to one grocery store to bar in Saranac Lake <laughs> by going to a restaurant by hanging out with your friends you can't do and for a long time we couldn't do any of those things so we were forced watching the screen, regardless of which station. And so you were watching this over and over again. And this is why we're in this moment. Now, I want to talk about anti-racist allyship, right? Because we're running out of time. We only have one minute left, but I'm going to let this go a little bit long. So those of you who can stay with us, please stay with us. Um, what is, and we've talked about uh, anti-racist allyship, but we haven't defined allyship. And I want to take a moment because we're coming to the end of this. Um, what is allyship? Forbes. So I went to the capitalist to define allyship. <laughs> Did you hear me? I went to the capitalist to define allyship. Forbes. Forbes magazine says allyship is. Allyship is a lifelong process of building relationships based on trust, consistency, and accountability with marginalized individuals and or groups of people. Not self-defined not not self-defined work and efforts must be recognized by those you are seeking to ally with that last sentence didn't make no sense but you get the first part of it right so um yes allyship now when we were talking before michelle you you brought up um anti-racist accomplice as opposed to um anti-racist allyship right so what i'm going to do for just one second if you'll bear with me i found this radically wonderful website and I'm gonna share my screen with everyone so they can see what I'm saying. 
just for a second. Cause I thought she making this stuff, this stuff up man, about accomplice. She making this up. So I found this website and can you all see the screen? Mm -hmm. So it says actor, ally and accomplice. And so what it suggests is that um, the person who wrote this said they did, a, um, they, they, they wrote this based on communicating with black people and people of color um, and, and looking at the intersection of multiple systems and how they converge to, to define um, um, oppression, to define black people's specific oppression in America. So if you're an actor, the actions of an actor do not disrupt the status quo, much the same as a spectator at a game. Both have only nominal effect in shifting an overall outcome, right? An ally, it says, an ally is typically considered a verb. One needs to act as an ally and cannot bestow this title on themselves, right? Accomplice. No, this is Michelle, Dr. Dr. Cromwell said, she is going to, I, you got to talk to us about why using accomplice over ally, right? So the actions of an accomplice are meant to directly change institutionalized racism, colonization, and white supremacy by blocking or impeding racist people policies and structures, right? So I'm just giving you the, the first couple of lines from this website. So, so talk to me now about the differences there and um, let's get at it. Let me stop sharing my screen real quick. Let's get at it. So we, we're almost out of time, so I'll be brief. Yeah. You know, and you didn't believe me, but you had to see it. You're a good student. You've been taught by the white dominance. Yes, I understand. That's right. And but, in, but, in a good way, too. But everything. Though, an ally for me is somebody that, that can be self-serving. That, that wants to say that I stand with you and, and they're well-intentioned, but I like to say the road to hell is built with good intentions. So the good intentions of an ally don't necessarily help to move the work because like I like to say, when the bombs drop, the allies are not gonna stay there with you in the foxhole. They would run for cover because that's what, 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 what happens. You know, that's the, um, the term is coming to my head, but the accomplice is that person that's going to stand at your side and be with you to act and to shift and to change institutions. And one of the things that I'm not sure that, that Nikki read is that the accomplice is somebody that isn't emotionally fragile. Mm -hmm. Allies, we talked a little bit about the white tears. The allies- We haven't are, talked about white tears yet. Okay, the allies, are, the allies can tend to be fragile because it's self-serving. They still, they still haven't dealt with their stuff. So they can, you know, they can break apart and they can fall into pieces, but the accomplice has done the work, yeah. which is the anti-racism work. Yeah. The accomplice has done the work and they're ready to solder up and to be an activist with you. So the accomplice is somebody that's ready to act. And for me, I, you know, I don't mean to be um, insulting, but I don't want any allies. I don't want an ally. I want an accomplice. Mm, powerful. So quickly, what do you, what do you think? Oh, no, you, you have it perfectly. You have it perfectly. I'm just, I'm waiting. I don't want to take up too much time. <laughs> I, I, want to, I want to, to, to move quickly to, to, to just the last thing, because we're getting into where we're going to lead into our next session when we have our next session, right? So here we are, how not to be part of the problem. And here was, here's what we're talking about, um, what allies need to do or accomplices, as, as, as Dr. Cromwell has said. You don't have to pretend to be free of racism to be an anti-racist. I'm just gonna leave you with two or three anecdotes. You do not have to pretend to be free of, of racism to be an anti-racist. And we just talked about um, white supremacy, racism. We gave you some, some, some definitions that you can use and hold on to that can really inform your development. Being an anti-racist means you assume racism is everywhere operating every day. Right? Now, Michelle, Michelle at, the, at the end, Michelle said that um, allies um, I don't. I don't want to misspeak, but you said allies tend to be um, sensitive, right? They can be um, carried, emotionally fragile. Emotionally fragile. What I want you to do now. So, in closing, the next session will then take up from where we left off, right? White allies, white activists, you need to work through your white shame, guilt, and denial, right? So we're going to take that up, and we're going to start from there. 
work through your right saying shame, guilt, and denial, because that is where if you stay there, you're going to become immobilized, right? Mm -hmm. You need to work through that and become and, 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 and develop your stamina with being uncomfortable with listening and hearing and learning about, about whiteness, about the power that's, that's endemic in whiteness, mm -hmm. about anti-Blackness and how you participate in perpetuating anti-Blackness and, and oppressing other people of color. So work through the guilt, work through and stop apologizing. Just, we can't use it. Stop apologizing for being white. Stop apologizing for, we need you to start doing the work, right? Doing the work means that you recognize you don't have to say I'm racist in order to do anti-racist work. We're not asking you about that, right? We are already know that we are all, the, this society, um, racism is, is systemic, but it's also insidious, right? What does that mean? You cannot escape it as a white person or as a, a person of color or a black person anyway. So this is where we're gonna end. I want to invite you for our next session. It'll be um, another Monday and we'll let you know um, at the same time, six o'clock, um, where we'll take up where we left off. And so now, how do you work through your white shame, guilt and denial? What does that look like? Um, strategies, tips, um, okay. All right, so um, I wanna thank our panelists, my round table, Yes, um, um, Dr. Michelle Cromwell, Dr. Um, Marsha Nicole, and my, my brother Clifton. Yeah, we didn't even get to talking about, um, you know, policing our black bodies. Yeah, and that the fact that not just law enforcement polices. So we'll talk about what it looks like when, when, when non-law enforcement people, everyday white folk police black and black people. Okay, so thank you so much for your time. We're gonna, we have, do we have any questions? We have one single question and I, I feel like if I, we have two questions? Okay, all right, so we have, um, go ahead and switch. I'm gonna switch really, really quickly so that I can, um, make calls, so that I can see um, if there are any questions from the, from the, from the chat. Now, the first question is, how do I welcome, is that BIPOC, so black people and people of color, friends into the outdoors without acting as a gatekeeper? Mm -hmm. And the person says, I don't want to ignore safety concerns. How do I welcome people of color into the outdoors without acting as a gatekeeper? I don't think you can. I think you are a gatekeeper. Especially if the, if this this the Adirondacks is the outdoors that you're talking about, you are the person who are going to show us um, the beauty, right? But there is there is there is there. I'm going to be honest. I since especially since the the march, um, the protests in um, in Saranac Lake, I haven't gone out alone. I carry a white body with me. I carry a white body with me. Because, because black people, this outdoors, as I said before, has never been a safe place for, for black bodies. And so I do that. Um, so, so gatekeeper is, is different if you are there to be um, uh, um, because of safety concerns or to assuage the safety concerns of your black friends or black colleagues or black people, then by all means, keep doing that. Keep doing that. Any other questions? Nope, that's it. That's it, one question. All right, thank you so much for your time. Um, we will announce the next session, which will start from working through how white allies can work through their um, shame, guilt, and denial. Thank you all for your time today. I hope this was worth it. Um, we gave you some foundational knowledge to take to the next level. All right, enjoy your day. Thank you so much, bye-bye. <laughs>